purpose of this video is to describe the difference between energy and power signals. We'll begin by looking at a uh, simple electrical circuit. And in fact, they don't get much simpler than this. So I have a resistor with resistance R. I have some voltage across the resistor that I might call V of T because it could conceivably be changing. I have a current that goes through the resistor, which I'll call I of T. And we're interested, in this case, at looking at the power associated with the resistor. In other words, the power that's dissipated by the resistor as the current I flows through it. So hopefully you'll remember from uh, your circuit analysis classes that power is V squared over R, uh, or that it's also I squared times R. Okay. So, um, yeah, basically the idea is that the rate at which energy is dissipated by the resistor is, um, is given by either the V squared over R, the sky, I squared times R. And so in both cases we can say that power is proportional to V squared and that power is proportional with a different proportionality constant to I squared. And what is done in signal processing or more generally in signals and systems is to basically then say that for any signal um, if I have an arbitrary signal X of T, that power or energy is proportional, well actually that power, uh, not energy, that power is proportional to the magnitude of the signal squared. Okay, so I'm using conceptually these ideas that power is proportional to the square of voltage or power is proportional to the square of current to say that in general the power associated with the signal is the square of its magnitude. So two points. In, uh, in systems we typically talk about this quantity being the power of the signal when in reality signals by themselves don't have power or don't dissipate power until they're run through a resistive element or some other type of mechanical thing that actually dissipates power. But we still talk about the signal as if it had power, which is the magnitude squared. The other thing is that you'll notice that I've got these absolute value signs around the signal X. Uh, that allows me to use the same definition for complex signals. And you're wondering, how on earth can a signal have a real part and an imaginary part? Uh, in the real world, signals have real parts. They don't have imaginary parts. But mathematically, we often define complex signals because they're mathematically useful. They allow us to do very useful and interesting things. And so that's why we've uh, represented this definition uh, with the magnitude squared, so that if we have a complex signal, uh, our definition still holds. So this gives us essentially instantaneous power. Okay, this is the power that is instantaneously uh, delivered by a signal uh, x of t at time t. Um, now, hopefully you'll recall that energy which is the, well, again, power is energy per unit time. So total energy is just the integral from minus infinity to infinity of the power. Okay, because again, if I've got power, which is energy per unit time, I get energy by integrating over all time. Uh, conceptually, I can draw this like this. So this is time. Um, this is my signal. Uh, suppose I have, uh, well, for 
want of anything more interesting, a signal x of t that looks like this. Okay. And I square x of t, and uh, suppose I then get a signal that ends up looking like this. So this guy here is x of t squared. The energy in this uh, signal is going to be the area under the square of x of t. Again, that's conceptually what an integral is. So basically, the energy in this signal is going to be the area of this uh, region that I've shaded in here. Okay, so that's how we define energy. Again, we take instantaneous power and integrate that over all time, and that gives us the energy. Um, let's look at another signal that shows up actually quite a bit more often than the one that I just drew here. Suppose that I have a signal that looks like a sine wave. Okay, so I have my signal that looks like this, and it goes on out to infinity. It continues to wiggle out to minus infinity. So this is a sine wave. Okay, so we'll say that this is x of t. And I want to find the energy in this signal. Well, again, the, if I take this signal and square it, then I get um, a signal that looks sort of like this purple guy. That would look more like this purple guy if I could draw correctly. Okay. So this is my x of t squared. Okay, now the energy in this signal, in this sinusoid, is going to be the area, oh, here we'll get this uglier color to be consistent, it's going to be the area under this x of t squared, and I look at the area from minus infinity to infinity. And you can see, hopefully, because this signal extends out to infinity, the squared signal, x of t squared, extends out to infinity in both directions. So this area, in this case, the energy is going to be infinite. Because um, as I go out to infinity in either direction, the, uh, the area uh, increases. So, so the total area is going to be infinite. So this is a situation for which a signal does not have finite energy, but um, it does, as you can see from the purple line here, this is a, everywhere this line exists is finite, so it has finite instantaneous power, and it turns out then that we can also um, talk about its average power. And so the average power uh, let's see, we'll clear out the space up here. Okay, so the average power of a signal is going to be the following. Uh, we need to back off a little bit so we've got more space. It's going to be the limit as some t approaches infinity of 1 over t times the integral from minus t over 2 to t over 2 of the magnitude squared of x of t. Okay, so what does this actually mean? Well, the idea here is that we choose a value of t. So in this case, let's choose this distance as t. And what we do, this integral, is computing the energy in the signal from minus t over 2. So this point over here is minus t over 2. This is t over 2. So I'm computing the energy in the signal, which is the area from minus t over 2 to t over 2. And then I'm dividing it by t. 
So that gives me the average power in the integral from minus t over 2 to t over 2. Okay, so this term here is the average power in the signal from minus t over 2 to t over 2. Now you can see in my graph here, let me choose a different value of t so we can get as many weird colors into this picture as we can. So if I make t somewhat bigger, and now look at the energy from minus t over 2 to t, you can see that that average energy is probably going to be different than the average energy I had by looking uh, from here to here. Okay, And so the idea is I want to take the limit as t goes to infinity to smooth out all these variations in power. And so essentially what I do is I just compute the average power, uh, conceptually at least, over larger and larger dif distances until, again, I take the limit as t goes to infinity, and that gives me the average power. Okay, so just a few more, well, and it turns out if uh, this original signal here, if x of t is a cosine or a sine, that the average power, uh, the, the magnitude of the cosine or sine goes from minus 1 up to 1, and the squared value goes from 0 to 1, it turns out then that the average power is going to be the average of this signal, which I've drawn badly, but the average of this signal is just 1 half. So for the case of a cosine or a sine, the average power is just 1 half. So we have two ex examples of two different types of signals here. This signal is one for which the energy is finite and greater than zero. The sinusoid is one for which the energy is infinite, but the power is finite. So we would call this signal an energy signal because it has finite energy. We would call this signal a power signal because it has finite power but infinite energy. I will leave it as an exercise to the interested viewer to show that if I have an energy signal, the power of, or the average power of that signal is zero. Um, again, in a power signal, the energy is infinite and the power is finite. So that concludes the discussion of energy and power signals.